In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the extinguishment, extinguishment of debt and also some ratios that deal with long-term liabilities. All right, first we're going to talk, cover the extinguishment of debt. Um, most often, debt is going to be extinguished at maturity. And so in that case, the final payment uh, that is made and the par value or the face value of the debt are equal. And so since the payment and the face value are equal, there will be no gains or losses when the debt is repaid at maturity. However, sometimes debt can be extinguished prior to maturity. And in those cases, uh, there could be several reasons it could be called early. One uh, could be that there's a call option, meaning that the issuer of the debt has the option to extinguish the debt early at a predetermined price. Uh, firms can also reacquire the debt through mo open, market tra uh, open market transactions. And so in those cases, again, they could extinguish the debt prior to its maturity. And because we're extinguishing the debt prior to maturity, uh, it's, it's very likely that the book value is not going to equal the price that is paid, either as part of the call option or as part of the open market transaction. And so if the book value is not equal to the price that's paid, then there could be a gain or a loss at the extinguishment uh, when it happens prior to maturity. So as an example, 49er Companies uh, issues $600,000 in 10-year annual bonds on January 1st, 2018 at 98. The coupon rate is 6%. And the issuance includes a call option with a call price of 101. 49er exercises the call option October 31st, 2020, and they use a straight line method to amortize the premium. So how do we record the extinguishment of the debt? So there are two things that 49er must do when the debt is extinguished. First, they have to record any accrued interest. And so in this case, since the extinguishment takes place on October 31st, there will be accrued interest since interest is paid on December 31st each year. Secondly, the 49er has to then record the redemption, which is to take off the book value of the debt, uh, along with, of course, the call price that is paid. All right, so in the example that we have, the first thing we're going to do is accrue interest. And so there are two pieces. First of all, there's the interest payment that is owed, and that's according to the contract. In this case, the bond rate was 6%. We apply that to the par value of 600000 And of course, during 2020, 10 months had lapsed since the last interest payment date. So we have to accrue 10 twelfths, which totals $30,000. We also have to record any amortization of the discount. In this case, the total discount was 2% of the par value. Uh, but of course, during the current year, we only have to, um, or every any given year, we're going to amortize one-tenth of that because it's a 10-year bond. And so the total discount is $12,000. We amortize that over 10 years, which is $1,200 per year. And so in 2020, it's only a partial year, and so we amortize 10 twelfths of the annual amount for a total of $1,000. And so those two portions of the entry are pretty straightforward. We have the accrued interest payable of $30,000, and we have the discount on bonds payable of $1,000. It's a credit, of course, because we're amortizing that discount. Um, and so from that, we infer or we derive an interest expense of 31,000 that would have accrued over the first 10 months of 2020 prior to the extinguishment of the debt. And so now we have to record the redemption. There's a little more going on here. Uh, first of all, we do have to record the total cash payment. And so not only do we have the price, which is 101% of the par value, but of course they also have to pay the contractually accrued interest. And so the total amount that they're going to pay is $636,000 when they extinguish this debt. Secondly, they do have to remove any remaining discount balance. The original balance was $12,000. In 2018 and 2019, they would have amortized $1,200 in each of those years. And so the balance would have already been reduced $2,400. And of course, there's the additional $1,000 of amortization that we recorded on October 31st prior to the redemption entry. And so that total balance would have been an $8,600 debit. And so to remove that balance, we need an $8,600 credit. Of course, we have to remove the bond payable with has a credit balance, so the entry will be a $600,000 debit entry. And then we have to remove the interest payable that we just previously entered into our account, and so that's a credit balance, and so to get rid of that account, we need a $30,000 debit. And then, of course, because we are 
uh, extinguishing the debt prior to maturity, there is likely to be a gain or loss, and in this case that gain or loss would be a plug into this final journal entry. All right, so looking at the information that we calculated, we can see that the bonds payable and the interest payable are our debits, and the discount on bonds payable and the cash are our credits. And so then we just have to look for where the plug belongs. And of course, the, it's a debit, and so that means we have a loss on bond redemption, which essentially means that we paid more than the book value of the bonds if we include both the price and any differences between the accrued interest expense and the accrued interest payable. All right, there are two ratios that we need to consider when we're talking about long-term liabilities. First, we're going to talk about the debt to assets ratio. It is a measure of solvency, which is basically a measure of financial risk, the ability for a company to meet all of its obligations, both current and non-current. The measure is debt to assets equals total liabilities over total assets. And so in this case, the higher the debt to asset ratio, the lower the solvency. In other words, the firm is then less able to meet its long-term obligations. And so um, as total liabilities increase, or of course, as total assets decrease, uh, their ability to meet those obligations is going to become more difficult. Uh, like any ratio, we wouldn't necessarily say good or bad when it comes to amounts. Um, we want to sort of look at industry standards, look at the company over time, uh, and kind of look at each situation to see whether the solvency ratio is appropriate or not. And so again, it's case by case basis. The second ratio is the times interest earned ratio, and this measures a company's ability to make interest payments. And the measure for that is income before taxes and interest expense divided by the interest expense. And in this case, the higher the ratio, the better able the company is to make its interest payments. Of course, there'd be two ways for that to happen. One would be to have higher income, or two, lower interest expense. In either case, the company is better able to make interest payments as that ratio increases. And similar to the debt to assets ratio, I, uh, we, we don't really want to say whether a higher number or what number is good or bad, they're just different. And so context is important again for this measure as with any other ratio.